Well, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Diet and Brain Health. I'm Greg Berry, Assistant Director in the UAB Office of Alumni Matters. Just a quick note, since we're virtual, don't be surprised if things may seem out of place or a technical issue pops up. If you experience any issues with your video or audio, please click the reconnect button at the top of your screen. This will get you back to the webinar right away. And if you receive multiple text reminders for today's session, I apologize. We're working on a new platform and ex we experienced issues deploying these texts. So that's why we may have seen some duplicate text. Just a heads up, today's webinar is being recorded. We will be uploading that onto our website tomorrow. If you have any questions throughout this afternoon, please place them in the chat room. We'll have time for a Q&A at the end of today's presentation. Well, today we're discussing why dietary choices are strongly associated with stroke risk and brain health. We are excited to welcome Dr. Suzanne Judd for today's webinar. Dr. Judd is the director of the Lister Hill Center for Health Policy and a professor in the UAB School of Public Health. She joined the UAB family in 2008 and as an associate professor after spending time as an engineer at Kimberly Clark. She and her Master of Public Health and PhD in Biological and Biomedical Sciences from Emory University. At this time, I would like to formally welcome Dr. Judd to the webinar. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, this is actually my, my favorite piece of research that I do is looking at diets and what diets people eat and how they influence health, specifically brain health. But before we do that, I want us all to sit and think for a second about diet and about nutrition. Who gave you your last piece of nutrition advice? If you really sit with that and think, where did it come from? Did it come from a personal trainer? Did it come from a, a doctor, a friend, a book, a magazine? Nutrition advice is all over the place in the United States. You can find it everywhere. So it's something that's very confusing to people because there are so many different sources. You, you often get conflicting information. But that's not unique to the United States, and it's certainly not unique to this time period. Some people think that diet and the talking about diet is brand new, but you can actually trace back through history in the United States and go to the early part of the 1800s with the Kellogg brothers. And if you look at the Kellogg brothers and what they were trying to do, they were trying to create the absolute perfect food for optimum health. They founded the Battle Creek Sanitarium, which was like a wellness resort for the, the elite, the wealthy, to come and try out these new dietary practices that the, the brothers had, which included this perfect food called toasted cornflakes, which of course became Kellogg's cornflakes eventually. In the 50s and 60s, Ansel Keys was a very famous scientist and uh, physician who was working with the army and also trying to find the perfect food. His perfect food was because he wanted to find something that he could get GIs to toss in their backpack. They could land on the shores of Normandy or down in the south of France, and they could live for weeks with just the food they had in their backpack. And he called it the K ration. It was supposed to be nutritionally balanced so that the, the soldiers could survive um, for many weeks without resupply. And, and interesting, you'll notice that in the 40s, cigarettes were a part of that important package because cigarettes helped to keep the soldiers from being hungry. While Ansel Keys was in Europe, he spent a lot of time in the southern part of Italy. And when he came home from World War II, he was just fascinated by the fact that there were a lot of people living in the southern part of Italy in the Mediterranean that seemed to live past 100. And where he was from, which was uh, Minnesota, he saw a lot of businessmen who were dying in their 50s and 60s of heart disease. He really thought it was attributed to diet. And so he attributed it to this diet that he saw in the Mediterranean that was heavy in legumes, fish, fruits, vegetables. They ate a ton of oil and had very little access to dairy. So very little dairy they were consuming. This idea of the Mediterranean diet kind of stayed with us as researchers for many years, but it wasn't until 1995 when a group from Harvard um, categorized what the Mediterranean diet was and how we could measure it in various populations. Their, their focus was similar to what Ansel Keys observed with vegetables and fruits and legumes and uh, olive oil, fish, and wine. So what do you need to, to eat to improve brain health? We've talked a little bit about Mediterranean diet and what others have thought. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from The Simpsons, where Homer decides that he can just concentrate food to unleash its awesome power and compress all of the food you need into one handy mouth-sized um, bar. We're gonna take a step back. Those of you that saw my uh, discussion on um, concussions a couple of months ago, actually probably last year, 
I talked a little bit about epidemiology because it's important for you to think about how we use epidemiology to answer a question. And in epidemiology, we, we're looking for an exposure and then disease relationship. What's the relationship between diet and brain health? And there are all these things called confounders that can, can change that depending on what you measure. In the case of what we're talking about today, we're talking about diet as the exposure and brain health is the outcome. So you'll want to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as I go through some of the data that's available. How do we measure diet and brain health? Well, this is another thing I want you to think about. Um, in epidemiology, it can be very tricky to measure certain things. And, and I'd argue that diet is among the most tricky things to measure. Why? Because we eat every day multiple times a day. So how do you quantify what your actual diet is? Now, some people might have be very strict and say, oh, you know, I follow this, um, this paleo lifestyle or a very specific dietary plan so they feel like they can describe it. But others just kind of eat what's there. And some people don't even think about what they eat at all. So it can be very difficult to assess what people eat. I'm gonna talk about three different types of brain changes. We're gonna talk about cognitive changes, which those are changes where we administer questionnaires to people and we look at how their score changes throughout time. We're gonna talk a little bit about dementia, which is actually a clinical diagnosis uh, that our patients and participants get, and then stroke. So we'll have a couple of different ways to look at diet and a couple of different ways to look at, at uh, brain health. There are other types of ways to collect dietary data too. Another way is a clinical trial, um, and that's really considered the, the gold standard if we, if we want to understand a diet disease relationship. And in this case, you, you randomly assign people to a specific diet. There are two ways that you can get people to, to have a specific diet. You can either feed them directly where they pick up the food from you, or you can provide educational materials and hope they change their diet. I'm here to tell you as a nutritional epidemiologist, people don't change their diet very often. That's actually one of the harder things in, in, um, in medicine and health that we have is to try to get people to change their diet. So the, the clinical trial approach has been challenging at times um, when we look at, at how we assess diet. That said, there's one big trial called the Predimed trial. It took place in the south of Spain, um, and they were trying to, to determine the effect of a Mediterranean diet on cognitive changes. And basically, that dark blue square all the way to the right that shows the cognitive score decreasing, that's the standard diet um, that, that doesn't have any kind of a Mediterranean inter intervention. The two lighter blue lines are two different Mediterranean interventions. One was an olive oil and the other was a nut, primarily walnuts and macadamia nuts, where they told participants, okay, here's your liter of olive oil, use this as much as possible throughout the week. And the same thing with the nuts. They gave the nuts and said, eat these as, as often as you possibly can. And then, oh, by the way, also adhere to these other components of the Mediterranean diet. But from this clinical trial, we can see that the, that change in fat and that change in um, trying to eat more legumes, more fruits and vegetables was associated with better cognitive function after about eight years of follow-up. This same group also looked at stroke. And in the, the stroke group, when we look at numbers in epidemiology, when you see a number less than one, that generally indicates that the, the um, item you're studying is, is protective or good for you. And in this case, the folks that were randomized to that olive oil arm, you can see that they've got a, a pretty um, a number that's pretty far from one at 0 0.65. And the nuts group was 0 0.54. Both of those indicate a pretty strong association that the people eating the Mediterranean diet with one of two types of, of fat were associated with lower rates of stroke. So here in this clinical trial, we're starting to see some pretty strong evidence for the, the types of food in the diet. I'm gonna switch now and tell you what I do with diet um, and what I look at, it's using a cohort study. So kind of thinking about what a cohort study is, we call people and say, hey, would you like to be a part of our study? We're going to ask you some questions and then we're gonna follow you for as long as you'll let us follow you. Um, so we, we follow people, we ask them about their health, whether or not they've had a stroke, um, and, and the analysis is longitudinal in nature. But the good thing is that we can assess the diet before we actually um, see what happens with the stroke. Uh, there's a question about the type of olive oil. There is not a specific type of olive oil that's preferred at this point in time. You just want to make sure you know whether you're using it to cook for high heat or using it for salad dressings. Some of the extra virgin olive oils can burn at high heats, um, so you don't really want to cook with those. You want to use those more as a, 
um, like if you're using it in um, salad dressings. In my own study, it's called the REGARD study, um, we had participants spread throughout the United States, roughly 30,000 participants, about half Black American, half White American, and the goal is to understand why there are racial and regional differences in stroke, um, but we're going to focus on the dietary side of REGARDS. What we did is, is assess dietary pattern, and of course we started again with that Mediterranean diet that I've already talked to you a little bit about. We used the score that was created back in 1995 um, that gives people positive points for the number of vegetables, fruits, legumes like beans, uh, cereals, which includes bread, pasta, and rice, fish, and then they lose points for meat and dairy and gain points for eating um, fats that are closer to olive oil. That MUFAs to saturated fat, fat that's just a, a comparison of different types of fats. Olive oil is a monounsaturated fat and um, lots of the fats and nuts are as well. So this score looks at the ratio of those two things. You also get positive points for alcohol with the Mediterranean diet. Basically, you get one point for each of one of those components. So when we look at the Mediterranean diet in regards, again, um, looking at stroke, the we're looking for that number to be less than one because that's an indication that um, it's associated with, um, with fewer strokes. And in this case, I've got the the uh, adherence categories flipped, but we had um, people that were the highest adherers to the Mediterranean diet, those components over here, the vegetables, fruits, legumes, cereal, those are the folks that are least likely to have a stroke in regards. We also have that cognitive function data again. Interestingly with cognitive function and one of the biggest challenges is diabetes. Um, there, there often is a, an, um, what we call in, in statistics and interaction, but it just means that where the association is different uh, depending on whether or not you have diabetes. And what you can see here is that in people with diabetes, we did not see much of an association with the Mediterranean diet. But in the people without diabetes, we saw again, a pretty strong association that that Mediterranean diet was protective. So now here comes the trick in epidemiology. Does that mean that the Mediterranean diet is not associated with cognitive decline in people with diabetes? Probably not. Um, it probably means that we didn't measure it in quite the right way. It probably means that the questionnaire was not specific to people with diabetes. I mentioned earlier that it's really hard to get people to change their diet. Well, there's one group um, that it's usually a little bit easier to get people to change their diet, and that's people with diabetes. Diabetes actually um, is um, associated with changes in how you feel, where often you, you can tell that you're not feeling well. So people notice when they eat a high sugar snack that they don't feel as well afterwards. And so they'll change their diet from what the doctor said, but also from what they feel. Um, it's a great question on the, the kitchen sink. Um, the kitchen sink just means that those covariates that I mentioned at the beginning, that it's um, we adjust for everything. We adjust for the age of the person, for um, whether or not they have high blood pressure, diabetes, all these different types of things. So, um, so that it just means everything we can possibly think of to adjust for. People with diabetes um, do tend to be older, uh, but that does not usually explain away the association. It, it really, it's really something related to the fact that uh, having a diagnosis of diabetes often makes people change their diet. And so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit harder to to tease out that association of diet in those people. All right, we can also look at diet in a slightly different way. We can say, I don't wanna put a label on a healthy diet. What's the Mediterranean even mean in the United States? We certainly don't eat a Mediterranean diet. Our wines are grown in different soil. They're just, I don't wanna put a label on it. So another approach we can do is just look at what people report eating and allow the data to create a dietary pattern. So we, we look at it, we put it into the, the computer algorithm, it sorts the foods that people are most likely to eat together, and, and it can tell us what, um, what types of foods people in our population are eating and, and eating together. <clears throat> in regards, we had five dietary patterns emerge. These are the, the patterns that we had. Uh, factor one was a, a, a pattern that was associated with a lot of meat, some pasta, Mexican dishes, pizza, red meat, um, Chinese food. We labeled this the convenience pattern because it seemed to be people that go out to eat a lot. Um, factor two looked fairly healthy with lots of vegetables, some fish, some fruit, salads, uh, poultry, and especially non-fried foods. 
Factor three was a tough one to figure out. You're looking at miscellaneous sugars, which just means like desserts and things like that, candy bars, um, chocolate, <laughs> candy, a lot of added fat, sweetened breakfast foods like pancakes um, and, and those kind of frozen things you'd find in the, the freezer section, and a lot of high fat dairy. Factor four had a lot of fried food, a lot of eggs, um, added fats and sugar sweetened beverages. And then factor five was a little bit of an interesting pattern in that there was a lot of salad, a lot of alcohol and um, eggs and coffee. So again, when you do this type of analysis, you don't know what you're gonna get. You, just, you get these factors that just kind of show up that say people in your population are tending to eat these foods together. But we can still take those five dietary patterns and we can say, okay, they ate these types of things together, but how is that associated with diet? or with um, brain health outcomes. So again, remember, we've got these five patterns, the convenience, the plant-based, the sweets, the Southern, and then that alcohol. We called the, the fourth pattern Southern because it was more likely to be consumed in the South than it was in other parts of the United States. In this slide, what you can see is that people that had the greatest adherence to this plant-based diet, which very similar to the Mediterranean diet we've described, except didn't have as much alcohol, we see a reduction in general in stroke risk all the way over here at the fourth quartile. Uh, that just means the people that ate the most of this type of pattern, they're over here all the way on the edge. The Southern diet on the other hand, which was the one that had the most fat, um, high fat foods, fried foods, we see a slightly higher risk of stroke in people that are consuming that type of diet. This type of analysis makes it much more difficult to, um, to actually make dietary recommendations from. I'm gonna go back to the, the five patterns when we look at it, because of the fact that these patterns are very specific to regards, they would not necessarily be found in other population. Um, it just is, it's very tricky to see um, how we might translate this into policy. So we have to just take it and say, okay, we see that this pattern that's similar to, to other patterns observed like the Mediterranean diet, um, and then the Southern pattern that's almost the opposite of the Mediterranean, we kind of see that, that they're lining up in a similar way. And I saw a question about stroke or about stress and whether or not diet and stress are, um, are tied together. And it is definitely true um, on an individual basis that we know that uh, stress can mediate that association with diet and stroke on a population basis in regards, for example, we've not seen that association. Uh, it's, it's a little bit harder to, to do that type of analysis, but certainly when um, on an individual basis, when you're working with, with doctors and clinicians, uh, nutritionists, they've certainly noticed that stress is a key factor, um, both in terms of what people choose to eat and then how it, it goes on to be associated with um, stroke. Um, yep, yep, Stacy. great point about the diet and stroke, um, and diet can help the neuron pathway reconnect after a stroke. That's absolutely true. Those um, two parts of that are, are the fat that are in there, the, the types of fat, and also the antioxidants that are present in a, a high plant-based diet. So moving on from that type of analysis, let's think about diet in other countries, because that's the other challenge that we have when we look at diet is that diet's not the same everywhere in the world. We talked about Predimed and we talked about um, how if you got randomized to a very specific style of diet that those folks had a lower risk of stroke and also a lower rate of cognitive decline. We also um, looked at Regards, which was here in the U.S. <clears throat> We also have uh, studies like Rotterdam, Epic, UK, KO Bank, and um, the Million Person Study from China. They all have dietary data demonstrating that one or more of the, of the dietary factors in their um, population is associated with both dementia and um, stroke risk. So in general, we see the same pattern around uh, plant-based, around um, high nut consumption, low saturated fat consumption. Those are the types of factors that we see. Uh, Karen, question on whether or not it's best to eat fish and chicken and not pork and beef. That, that's correct. Um, fish is the best source of protein, specifically because fish comes with those fats. Fish tends to come with a, a high, especially the fatty fish, salmon, tuna, mackerel. They come with a lot of um, fatty acids that are omega-3 fatty acids that are really good for the brain. In fact, a funny a fact that you guys can take back and tell your friends, you've heard of snake oil salesmen. And people say, oh, he's a snake oil salesman or, or she's a, a snake oil salesperson. 
Um, well, it turns out that that saying comes from when uh, Chinese immigrants came to the U.S. to work on the rail lines. One of the things they brought with them was snake oil. And the snake oil from China was very specific to the Chinese water snake. And the Chinese water snake had a lot of omega-3 fatty acids similar to fish. So the fat that came from the Chinese water snake was very high, kind of like cod liver oil. So it was very good for people. Well, here in the U.S., especially in the West, where the, the rail line was being built, the, um, the folks were exposed to rattlesnakes. And so people would take rattlesnakes and make snake oil from the rattlesnakes and sell it. And it didn't work the way that the Chinese snake oil did. So that, that's where the origin of that term snake oil salesman comes from. But it's really around that, that beneficial fat um, that's found in fish, water snakes, which is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, Let's see here. The study I want to tell you a little bit about is a study from France. It's the three city study. Uh, it's a population based longitudinal study, about 10,000 people. So slightly less than what we talked about in regards. Um, they have very similar outcome measurement in terms of, of stroke and dementia and mortality. And a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to take a sabbatical to, to France, to the University of Bordeaux and um, was chatting with the, the folks there. And I was really hoping to go there and teach and do something radically different than what I do in the US, which is study diet and stroke. And they took one look at my CV and they said, eh, no, we want you to come to, to look at diet in our population and see what you see. And so I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. Let's see what you have. Well, their dietary um, questionnaire was not nearly as extensive as the one I'd been using. The one here in the US had 108 items. The one in Bordeaux only had about 10 items. So I had to take this very limited um, questionnaire and see if there was a way to create a dietary score. And what I did was I, I looked at all of the different items that were on that questionnaire and compared it to the ones that we'd seen in the US that were associated with healthy outcomes. And one point was given to people who consumed um, raw fruits, raw vegetables, or cooked fruits and vegetables. So the way they asked the question on the questionnaire was they were asked specifically about raw fruits, specifically about raw vegetables, and then cooked fruits and vegetables. So they could have a total of three points for fruits and vegetables, basically. They also could get a point for consuming legumes, which are like beans every day. One point given for people consuming fish at least uh, two or three times per week. And then one point for using olive oil as their primary source of cooking and um, salad dressing oil. So their total score was a possible of six points. And as I talked to the lead neurologist, the stroke neurologist on the study, and I told him what I was going to do once I got there and saw the data. He said, yeah, and we're glad you're here. We're excited to hear what you have to say, but it's, this is France. Diet is not, you're not gonna see an association. We all eat very healthfully. We don't eat like Americans, so you're just not gonna see anything here. Well, we took that score and we looked at stroke first. And you can see here that in fact, we do see something. There's that number, but less than one again, where we see that folks that were, um, having the most fruits and vegetables, the most legumes, um, drinking alcohol, those folks were actually, I come to think, I'm trying to look back. Um, I don't think alcohol was included in this fish. Fish was the big one. Alcohol, I think everyone was consuming. So there's no way to give a point for it. Um, but you see these folks are, they have a lower risk of stroke. So here it's showing that maybe this is not a great measure of diet, but when we take the things that we know about diet from the US, the things that have been helpful here, um, and, and look at it in France, we're also seeing this protective association. Same thing was true with dementia. Took that same score and looked at um, whether or not there was a, um, an association of this particular dietary score with dementia. And interestingly enough, we again found that it was protective. So people that were on the higher end, just something so simple as basically fruits and vegetables and beans and fish uh, and olive oil, and we're seeing a lower rate of dementia again. Um, Deborah, a question on healthy cheese for vegetarians who rely on that for protein. Cheese is probably not your best source of protein if you're a vegetarian. Uh, the legumes like beans and um, lentils are a great source of protein, some of the, the soy proteins. Um, so it, cheese works. There's definitely protein in cheese, but uh, you may also want to think about diversifying the protein source because it also comes with some nutrients that aren't present in cheese. Um, Let's see, a couple of other questions as we're looking at this. Um, there's a comment on folks that you can reach out if you're interested in some dietary advice. 
A uh, question, Paula, on whether or not the French eat a lot of organ meat. Absolutely. Not only do the French eat a lot of organ meat, they eat a lot of game. So it's not uncommon to see rabbit on the menu. Um, it's actually not uncommon to see horse or duck. Um, they, they eat a lot of varied meats. They don't just have a uh, pork, poultry, and or chicken and, and beef. They've got many more meats that, that would be included in that. Um, let's see. Katie, uh, fats derived from fish have a noticeably or a notably increased protective effect compared to plant-based sources. So those fats from fish, they the, especially the omega-3 fatty acids, uh, they do have a, a very unique effect on the brain. Um, the brain preferentially likes those omega-3 fatty acids. It helps with uh, longevity. It decreases inflammation. So those fish fats are important. Not all fish are extremely high in omega-3 fatty acids. There are certain fatty fish that are very, very high in it, like we mentioned before, or like I mentioned before with salmon and tuna and mackerel. So you really have to look and think about it. Um, you know, my rule of thumb is if you like it and you eat it, and that's great, but if you can only get it a couple of times a week, that's okay too. Um, it's, it is a definitely good fat, but you can also take fish oil supplements, which are also give you plenty of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, the vegan supplements that of omega-3 are derived from algae and they're perfectly good sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Absolutely. Um, yep. Bruce has, has made the point about one of the main factors for stroke prevention is related to omega-3s, and that's true. There have been great clinical trials related to omega-3 fatty acids. We know they work. Uh, a fish oil supplement definitely works, and it'd be worth talking to your doctor about it if you're interested. There are a couple of folks where omega-3 fatty acids might not be as, um, as beneficial, and your doctor would know. It's, it's particularly related to bleeding um, and whether or not you're getting ready for surgery and things like that, but, but in general, they're considered very safe. Uh, vegetarian meats compare? That's a really good question. Uh, vegetarian meats do not impact health in the same way that some of the red meats do. They don't come with saturated fat. If you had to pick the one big component, um, although some of my nutrition colleagues might argue that it's carnitine in, in meat, but let's go with fat. Those saturated fats in red meat, they tend to lay down fatty plaques in your arteries, plaques in your heart, plaques in your brain, plaques on your carotid, carotid artery. Those plaques become sources of inflammation um, and they can lead to strokes, heart attacks, all different types of things. So those, those saturated fats in meat um, tend to be the ones that are the biggest challenge. And part of the issue in the U.S. is we just really, we consume high quantities. Um, serving sizes are different in the U.S. than they are other places. And so we tend to have these really large servings of meat that also come with other um, things like carbohydrates and, and just winds up being in calorie excess. So uh, the, the vegan meats do appear to be a little bit healthier, um, but it depends. There, there's a huge range of vegan meats. They are everything from lentil based to um, to soy based. And, and so you just have to take a look and see what the, the protein fat composition is on all of them. Um, are the omega-3s that are synthetic as protective um, as the omega-3s derived from food? They do appear to be. Um, there are some folks that argue that the protein in fish is unique as well, but that evidence is really not strong. Uh, the supplements seem to be just as protective. Uh, can this diet affect or protect a diabetic? In terms of a, a Mediterranean diet, absolutely. There have been great studies looking at Mediterranean diets and how they um, are beneficial for, for diabetes. Um, Good fish oil supplement, in my opinion, it's about the taste, <laughs> to be honest with you. Some of them have a very fishy taste and they don't taste good. So for me personally, I take one that's called Nordic Naturals because I find that it doesn't taste, you know, I, I don't have a taste for that one. But some people don't mind the taste and they can drink cod liver oil just straight from the bottle. Um, congratulations if you're one of those people. I am not one of those people, <laughs> but it's that that's what you're looking for. You want a good solid amount of omega-3. There are different doses you need depending on your unique health um, concerns, whether or not you you're, you tend to have a high inflama inflammatory state, autoimmune disease, things like that. So it, the doses really depend on your personal needs. Um, I myself take about a thousand milligrams a day, but you know, again, that's what I choose for me. So it's really it's really up to you and what your health concerns are. Um, like I said, my favorite brand is the Nordic Naturals, but it's taste. It's a taste-based favorite. Um, Recommended amount of meat. There is actually no specific recommended amount of meat that there's a recommended amount of protein that, that's in the diet. 
Um, but it, it's the USDA acknowledges, um, which is the US Department of Agriculture, they're the ones responsible for dietary guidelines for Americans. And there's, there's not a specific amount of meat, but there is an amount of protein. And when you're thinking about food, um, you really wanna be thinking about how it balances out your hunger. Protein and fat tend to leave you feeling fuller for longer, as do um, like fiber, complex carbohydrates. So you wanna think about in your meal, how you balance out different um, items like meat, vegetables, um, grains to, to be full as long as you can um, and to, to make it to the next meal so you're less likely to snack. So it's not necessarily a specific amount, it's more um, how you use it to balance your own diet. Um, dairy, some, let's see, talking about dairy, um, for thinking it was good for strong bones. That, that's exactly right. That was a marketing campaign from the, the U.S. Dairy Council. One of the things that's unfortunate in the U.S. is that a lot of our dietary recommendations come to us from industry sponsors. The USDA has the dual role of um, maintaining agriculture in the United States and providing uh, dietary recommendations. And it's just a, it's a slippery slope for them to walk. And um, they do the best job with scientific based evidence that they have, but sometimes you have to think about for yourself if it makes sense. There are absolutely other sources of, of, um, of food that contain calcium. Um, so you can get plenty of calcium from places other than, than cow's milk. And some people have allergic reactions to cow's milk. Um, so they, they can't consume cow's milk and they wind up having to find alternatives either because they're lactose intolerant or they have an allergy to whey or casein, which are the two big proteins in dairy. Um, the, in terms of cheeses, the, the other interesting thing about France is that cheeses are not the same as they are here. The cheeses in France come with a ton of, of probiotics. They're fermented very heavily. Um, and so we had a whole argument while I was there about cheeses and how you look at cheese because it's not simple. They also don't all come from cows. In fact, sheep's milk cheese are the, one of the more common types of cheese you find in France. So again, it's really hard in the US for us to compare our diet to other places. We can't just say cheese because cheese might mean something different in different places. Um, where feta does tend to be a, a med in the Mediterranean diet, but it's not just feta. There are many, many more cheeses that, that we don't even talk about here in the US that are um, considered a part of the, the Mediterranean diet. Um, Alcohol in France typically consumed is wine. That, that was the predominant um, alcohol consumed. But here in the U.S., we saw a lot of beer in our population in addition to some spirits. Um, so it wasn't just those things. Um, diets of many small meals during the day versus a couple of big uh, meals. Good question, Grace Anna. Um, I, this is where... So there, there are two different things, the hats I wear as a scientist. I wear a hat as a scientist that is what's based on the science and that's based on the average human being. Then there's a hat I wear as an individual that's based on my individual health choices um, and my lifestyle. And sometimes what I do as an individual is not justified by science. I'm gonna tell you that right now. There are a few things that I do in my own diet, in my own exercise, in my own meal patterning that's loosely based on science, but I know it works for me. Um, and so in terms of, of small meals versus big meals, the, the jury's still out on that. Uh, there is plenty of science that indicates that small meals are beneficial for regulating your blood sugar, provided you don't eat at those small meals and help to keep people from overeating. There's also a ton of evidence that shows that um, fewer meals uh, during the day, like two to three, or even meal skipping is beneficial for uh, weight loss and maintaining um, adequate um, hunger levels. So the jury split, I, I would say it's probably up to you as an individual. And if you find that multiple small meals are how you make it through the day and, and meet your calorie needs without being overweight, that's the right way to go. On the other hand, if you find that you know, two or three meals a day is better for you, that's probably the way to go. I will say in France, I gave talks all over as a part of the, the um, Fulbright grant that I got. I was supposed to talk to high school students and, um, and talk about nutrition and, and what I know about it and what we do in the U.S. and what I'd observed in France. And the number one question I got from high school students, and I'm not kidding you, this was across probably eight or ten different high schools. They said, is it true that Americans eat in between meals? And I, I it always made me laugh at first. I was like, yeah, it, that's pretty true. This, this six small meals thing, it's something you hear a lot about. Plus, we love our snacks. 
And they would be just appalled. And they would say, well, how in the world are you hungry for the real meal if you're eating all day long? Um, at one point, there was a, a young girl who'd been in the U.S. and had um, been to a high school in the U.S. And she's like, no, it's true. They have donuts in every classroom. And the, it made me laugh because I, I guess that's what they, they look at and they see us bring food everywhere. And um, it's, it's just a, it's a very different um, mindset over in France. They don't snack. They hardly ever eat between meals. They focus very much so on breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they're much larger meals. Um, so it just is a little bit different. Um, let's see here. Um, repeating the point about alcohol, absolutely. Um, so the, the alcohol that's consumed primarily in um, the United States was beer, uh, some wine and some spirits. In France, it was primarily uh, white wine and red wine. Um, the, it, Red wine does contain some very specific compounds that are beneficial in terms of reducing inflammation, but the amount of red wine you have to drink to, to get the, the benefit from that antioxidant is extremely high. In general, the benefit from alcohol that we see for cardiovascular disease and brain health stems more from the fact that it changes the HDL-LDL balance, which is a cholesterol, gives you more of the good cholesterol, a little bit less of the bad cholesterol but it's a fine line with alcohol. You can consume too much very quickly and then have changes to your liver that lead to increased inflammation. So alcohol is a tricky one. Um, it, it works for some people, but, but not all people should consume alcohol. It's definitely not a recommendation. Uh, thoughts on intermittent fasting and brain health. There have been a couple of really great studies on intermittent fasting and brain health that have shown a, a cognitive benefit, uh, but there was one um, caveat in that on the fasting day, um, often there were decreases in cognitive function. So it could be with intermittent fasting and brain health that the benefit is, you know, specifically the long-term benefit and may not be the short-term benefit on the actual day that you fast. Um, beyond the, the supplements and fish, you can also get omega-3 fatty acids from nuts. Walnuts are a good source, flax um, and hemp, hemp seeds. So those three are all great sources of omega-3 fatty acids as well. Uh, in, in conclusion, you just looked at um, a ton of data, eight different dietary patterns in three different countries using three, diff or, yeah, three different brain health outcomes. So we've seen a lot of, of different dietary patterns um, and, and, and um, how they affect brain outcomes. One thing I hope that I convinced you of is that diet, diet matters. It really does impact brain health. It impacts stroke risk risk of dementia and cognitive performance. In terms of the latest and greatest that the scientists are saying, um, the, the MIND diet is the one that's the most popular. This came from Rush, from Dr. Martha Morris, um, the late Dr. Martha Morris. She developed a, um, a, she took a look at American diets specifically. So this really comes out of American diets and said, what are the foods that seem over and over again, no matter what population we look at, what populations or what are these foods that seem to be good for the brain? And she combined what we've learned in the, the Mediterranean diet and with the DASH diet, which is a, a diet designed to stop hypertension, and identified 12 pro-brain food groups. And that's the green leafy vegetables, other vegetables, nuts, berries, beans, legumes, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil, and wine. So these are the foods that, you know, if you really want to walk away from here and say, okay, what should I put a little bit more of in my diet? and then look at what should I take a little bit more out of, maybe a little bit of the red meat, the fast and the fried and fast food, uh, pastry and sweets, butter and cheese. So these are the, the, the components of the MIND diet. The results of a clinical trial with this diet were just released. And in fact, people who changed their diet and ate more of the pro brain foods and less of the less beneficial brain foods, they actually call them unhealthy. I don't like to use the word unhealthy. Um, so my word is less beneficial. Um, they, they found that it's associated with um, cognitive protection. So eating those pro-brain foods really helped to preserve the cognitive function of people um, in the Chicago study. Uh, this, is a, this is probably the diet you're going to hear the most about in the next 10 years in neurology and brain health. It's the one that people are really starting to come around and, and think about how to operationalize it for patients. Um, the other big challenge in diet is, is how we talk to people about food. You're all here because you're interested in diet, so you may have some level already um, that you've thought about. But I can tell you 30% of the people that I talk to in a given day 
they don't think about their diet. They, they eat what's in front of them or what's convenient in that moment, um, whatever's prepared for them. So that it's, it's very different um, for a lot of people. So we wanna keep recommendations as simple as possible so that we can make the biggest difference in, in society. Um, a couple more questions came in while I was chatting. That's a great point about Dr. Peterson's work. She has fantastic work on intermittent fasting that I highly recommend folks take a look at in terms of, of what you're interested in, in learning about. Um, Deb, thanks for the question about hemp and CBD oil. They are not necessarily the same thing. Although CBD oil is derived from hemp, it's, um, it strips out a lot of the, the fats because they're, they're specifically trying to get CBD, which is a, a separate compound in hemp, out of the hemp and often the omega-3s are left behind. So uh, hemp oil would have a, just a tiny, tiny amount of CBD in it, but CBD oil likely does not have a ton of omega-3 unless they re-enrich it with the omega-3s. Um, yeah, Susan, the, the point about people eating differently and that food can make us feel good or bad. Um, it, it, I totally understand your point about the type of of food that makes you feel good. And, and it's great that that blood type diet is a, is a guide. That's, you have to be your own experimenter um, when you're, you're thinking about your own health. I think it's good to start from uh, what we see here with the, the MIND diet. That's a really good starting point if you wanna just, just guess. But then as you play with it, you might find that individual components of the MIND diet, like for example, beans and legumes, there are a lot of people that just can't tolerate them because they make them too gassy and people don't wanna be gassy. So they just, that's something they can't do. Um, the same is true with wine. Not everyone should drink wine. Uh, so it, it's not a, this is not, you must consume all of these things. It's a think about it. Think about where you can put a few more of these in and a few less of, of the, those fried and fast food and the pastry and sweets and butter. Um, it's definitely not a 100% solution. Uh, we've talked about a ton of different types of diets today. The, the one thing I wanted to say, because it, it cracks me up, is that probably the best nutrition advice came from a journalist. This is Michael Pollan, um, who wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma, meant, among a couple of other books. And his best quote is, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. That's probably the, the most important dietary advice that we can have. And it's really the exact same advice that the Kellogg brothers were trying to do with the Battle Creek Sanitarium back in the late 1800s. Um, we're, we're so lucky in the United States and that we live in a food rich environment. It's always easy to find food. Like the, the French um, student said, in American high schools, they had donuts sitting out. We just, food is everywhere here. So it's, it becomes harder and harder to make good choices. And people also find one diet that works for them. And then they tell everyone, you have to eat the way that I eat. But you know, the truth is that we're all individual and we have individual food choices um, that, that some of us prefer to eat like green vegetables. I love green vegetables and, and always have. My son and my husband do not. <laughs> so it's, it's just a, it's a personal lifestyle choice. Um, but absolutely, without a doubt, diet is associated with, with improved brain health, reduced risk of stroke, reduced risk of dementia, and it doesn't matter whether you live in, the, in France or the United States. So I see a few more questions coming in here. Um, the cheese mentioned in the less beneficial brain group, that's right, that comes from America. Um, I'm gonna go back to that slide. The reason that butter and cheese are specific here is in the US, we have a slightly different processing system for our cheese. And in general, they're associated with um, worse brain outcomes in the US, but not necessarily in France. And I'm just kind of scrolling through to see if I missed any comments. If I did miss your comment and you want to put it back in the chat, please feel free to do that. Yeah, Dr. Judd, I, I monitored a few and okay. I just slid them over to the Q&A. So one of the questions that I saw come through was, what about venison? Where does that fall? Yeah, that would be in the game category. Um, it tends to be more... Um, more like poultry in terms of the amount of saturated fat in it. So it tends to be a little bit more healthy than, than beef, but really just depends on, on the type of, of beef you're eating as well. So, it, it, but it is a meat. It's definitely a meat. And then did you see a lot of people with celiac disease outside the United States? You, you do um, see roughly the same proportion of celiac disease. There's two different diseases when you're looking at gluten. There's celiac disease and then there's gluten intolerance. 
Um, you probably see a little less gluten intolerance outside of the United States. Uh, we see more here than we do in other places, but actual celiac disease, which is a really specific condition um, where your body really overreacts to gluten, not just, oh, this makes me a little bit uncomfortable, but really can be quite a painful reaction. That, that's roughly the same in France and the United States. What is your number one tip for those wanting to make changes to their diet? If I have to pick one thing, it's fats. So make sure you're getting good fats, either from nuts or olive oil, um, coconut oil. There's avocado oil, avocados themselves. Those all contain really good fats for you. And if, if that's the only thing you can change, make that change. Second change would probably be green leafy vegetables. And third change would be berries. So do you need more participants for your studies and how can people get involved and be a part of those? Yeah, great question. So currently the only study I'm actively recruiting for is in Dallas County, Alabama and Wilcox County, Alabama. So if you live there, absolutely, I need more participants. Um, getting ready to have a new study, hopefully in the next two years. So stay tuned. You can look at the website, regardstudy.org. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the final um website. We changed the web link, but I'm almost positive that's where it is. Or the rural study. So just stay up to date on those two websites and um, and also take a look on UAB's website. There are tons of clinical trials out there related to nutrition. Uh, Dr. Peterson has a few. So yeah, be, be on the lookout. There are definitely trials you can be a part of. And if you want to send that to me, I'll send that in a follow-up email okay. tomorrow to the, the registrants of today's webinar. So thoughts on eggs daily? Wow, great question. Uh, for most people, yes. I think most people can tolerate eggs very comfortably. Some people have an allergy to eggs and some people don't handle cholesterol in their liver um, in exactly the same way. So there, there are these people that can actually overproduce the bad cholesterol in response to a high cholesterol diet, which eggs are very high in cholesterol. So again, that's something you have to look at for yourself. You can talk to your doctor about your cholesterol numbers. Um, you can see how eggs make you feel to see if you have that egg allergy. But again, that's another one that depends. But honestly, for 85% of you, eggs are probably fine. Beyond supplement caps and fish, are there good sources of omega-3? Yes, the flaxseed, uh, hemp seed, um, the borage oil, walnuts, um, those are all pretty good sources of omega-3. And then there's also an, an algae-based um, supplement. You mentioned avocado oil. How does it compare to olive oil? I think they're roughly the same. I actually now in my diet cook with both. I use both depending on what's available. Avocado oil doesn't burn. Um, so I mentioned earlier, that you have to be really careful with olive oil because if you saute with it, you can actually burn it and then it changes the taste. Avocado oil is much better at high temperatures. So I've actually started doing a lot of avocado oil when in my sauteing, in my, um, um, you know, anytime I'm cooking a meat or anything like that, I like the avocado oil. Sometimes I mix olive and avocado oil together. Um, but it, it's nutritionally, it's good. How does genetic testing like 23andMe factor into food choices in your opinion? Maybe it's off topic, but this person's curious since these are becoming increasingly popular. Yeah. Yeah. You can now find out in your genetic testing what your, you know, what your nutritional profile it is. It can say to you, oh, you are more likely to have um, trouble digesting lactose. I forget their four or five different things they look at when you do your 23andMe. So yeah, take a look at it. If there, if it identifies something that you think is um, causing an, an issue for you, then you might want to not eat that type of food. There are also now, in addition to 23andMe, all kinds of food sensitivity panels you can get through Everlywell. Just order those and it can talk to you about your whether you're sensitive to dairy, to eggs. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can do in addition to your genetics. Your genetics are not the only factor. Um, just because you have a gene for something doesn't mean that you can't eat that food. So it's it it it's something you have to experiment with. It's you know maybe one more piece of data, but not necessarily the be all end all. Besides walnuts and hemp seeds, what other nuts are good? The macadamia nuts is great. They're great. Um, there's a different balance of fats in the macadamia nuts. The other thing about nuts that's great is they have very high concentrations of magnesium and trace minerals. So you're getting more than just the fats when you're eating the nuts um, and a decent source of protein. Um, almonds, cashews, all of those are, are great. They're not omega-3 sources, but they're still great sources of, of good fat. Do you have any current diet research studies for which you're recruiting? I think we already answered that one, Dallas County. 
yep. um, yep, is for that one. one. And then uh, what about grilled meats that are charred? What does charring do? Besides taste really good? <laughs> I know, I know you're not supposed to eat charred food, but I love, ever since I was a kid, I, I love burnt toast. I don't know why, I just like that taste. Um, it, charring is um, not necessarily good for you though, especially with meats, that charring can lead to um, a greater inflammation response in the gut and some changes in the gut bacteria. So it's best to avoid highly charred foods. Um, but again, balance, it's all about balance and making sure you've got good uh, things to balance that out. If you're going to eat something that you know might be a little more inflammatory, like a fried food or a charred food, balancing that with some good berries, some greens, something to, to uh, balance it out in your body. Dr. Judd, the last 45, 50 minutes have been remarkable. And just the, the insight that you bring to this topic and, and the passion that you have, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for spending your time over your lunch hour with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. You are so welcome. And for everybody who attended today's webinar, a recording will be made available. Be sure to join us for upcoming webinars as well. On Thursday, May 19th, take part in comedy. Just say yes. During this webinar, we'll find out how we can develop our own happiness plan and learn why humor helps cope with stress. This is going to be hosted by Dr. Kevin Fontaine, professor and chair for the School of Public Health. Then on Tuesday, June 7th, be part of no-nonsense nutrition, balanced eating without breaking your budget. Raleigh Thornton, a registered dietitian and nutritionist, will join us to figure out ways to eat better while getting over the sticker shock at the grocery store. And on Tuesday, July 12th, we welcome Donald, or Dr. Ronald Laser for Save Your Brain, Do the Dirty Dozen Today for a Healthy Brain Tomorrow. During this virtual event, we'll explore modifying lifestyle behavior, habits, and conditions that impact our brains and what we can do now to benefit in the future. Register for these and other upcoming webinars online at alumni.uab.edu slash events. Blaze your own way with our 16th annual scholarship run presented by Viva Health. This year's run will be held Friday, April 22nd through Sunday, April 24th. It's your run. So support student scholarships by running wherever you'd like. If you'd like to sit on the couch and do it, that's fine too. Registration is only 35 bucks. Not only do you support students, you get a race t-shirt, and a finisher's medal. Find out more, including how to register at alumni.uab.edu slash 5K 10K. Let us help get you through your day or commute. Listen into the UAB Green and Told podcast. New episodes are released every other week. Listen back to episode 59, Your Diet, Your Health with Dr. Suzanne Judd. Fantastic conversation back in November with her. Download the podcast on Spotify and the Apple Podcast app or by visiting our website. And be sure to stay on top of all things alumni and social media. You can look us up by searching UAB Alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On LinkedIn, it is Alumni Career Community. So as we close this afternoon, be sure to give us feedback. The QR code on your screen will send you to a short survey. And I do mean short. I'll leave the slide up for a few moments as we wind down so you have a chance to provide us with your feedback. Once again, thank you for, uh, to today's guest, Dr. Suzanne Judd. Thank you all for joining us over this noon hour. And as always, Go Blazers.